For those who don't know me, I'm Tim Schwilk, and I'm the manager of the Tasting Zone Vets team here at the Wine Society. Tonight, I'm joined by my colleague, Catherine Housden, who will be managing the technical side of things. We do expect to be taking lots of questions from members this evening. So if you do have a question that you would like to pose to Toby, please do so using the Q&A button. Meanwhile, the chat box can be used for any general comments or feedback that you might like to share with your fellow members. If you're having a technical issue, please email us at tastings at the And while waiting for a response, you can head over to our YouTube channel where this, this event is being live streamed and a recording will also be available. If you are watching on YouTube at the moment and you'd like to ask a question, please use that tastings at the address and we'll be able to pose that to Toby during the night. But without any further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Toby this evening. Toby is celebrating his 30th year as a wine buyer at the Wine Society, which actually makes him one of the babies of the team and has been responsible for buying our Burgundy range since the 1995 vintage. So Toby, uh, welcome. But before we dive into the 2020 vintage and this particular offer, um, I thought it might be useful if you could just give some context to the Burgundy on Premier offer and how it fits in with your wider buying responsibilities. Uh, so do you mind just sharing some insight into what putting an offer like this entails and how important it is to, I guess, both you and, and the wine society? Sure, yeah. Um, the on-premier probably represents about 25 to 35% by value of our burgundy sales. So it's very important to us. Um, it sort of happens because in November... Uh, once the Burgundians have got the latest crop in, so when last year I was in Burgundy in November 21, um, they'd harvested the 21 vintage and they're selling the 20 vintage. And uh, November really is a time when, when, when you buy from the top domains in Burgundy, you tend to be given an allocation and the allocation tends to come out in November and at that point, you have to put your hand up for the wines. And the way it works is that uh, you get an allocation normally uh, of a certain size and price of the wines. And basically, you say yay or nay. And if you say nay, you go to the back of the queue and someone else takes your allocation and you may never, ever get back in. So it's a sort of long-term relationship that you have with the grower. And you can't sort of pop in and out um, and say, oh, I don't like that wine or that wine's superb, but could I have more of that one? No, basically it, it's a relatively rigid thing, but in, in a sort of way, it's a good thing because you, you get a guaranteed volume. Um, so that's the sort of way it works. Um, I think it's quite a difficult way to buy um, because you're judging wines very early and the earlier you judge a wine, you know, the more difficult it is. And um, in the case of Burgundy, you're there in November. Um, some of the wines may be bottled after 18 months. So you're, you're tasting them at 12 months old. And because the wines are unfinished, you know, they're still in, still in barrel. Um, there are many different operations that take place, racking, fining, filtering, bottling. Uh, which may have taken place at one person's domain, but not at another's. Um, you, it's strange to say, but if you go and taste two or three times during that period, the wines may well taste different, uh, differently, because partly it's the atmospheric pressure. Before the wines are bottled, there are still sediments and lees. And if you have a low-pressure, stormy um, uh, weather the lees are, are sort of um, are sort of uh, in suspension in the wine and if you get a very bright high pressure day um, the lees are very much at the bottom and the lees slightly muddy the aroma and the flavor um, so and also you know at the beginning when you go out I sort of go out normally end of October when the weather can be quite warm and the wines taste quite open. And I'm normally there for three weeks. And often by mid-November, um, you know, Burgundy is very continental. Um, 
you can be having frosts of minus three, minus four. The cellar temperature has maybe come down three or four degrees. And especially the red wines tighten up. So, um, you know, you're tasting wines during these different conditions. Um, and so I know some people hang on every adjective one writes, but you have to allow a certain margin of error because, you know, you're tasting wines that, that, that are unfinished. You know, it's a bit like sort of um, agreeing to buy a statue from a sculpture sculptor and going to see it when he's sort of chiseled out the outline of the figure. You've got the form of the figure, but the fine detail is not yet there. And, and that's really what's happening with Burgundy. Um, and also you're writing a note about a wine which may not be drunk for 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and all sorts of processes happen in bottle afterwards. You know, you've got hydrolysis and esterification, the way a wine um, develops, you know, there are periods when, it, when it's rearranging its tannins and it's quite closed and it comes out of it. And uh, some aromas, um, there are all sorts of things like precursors of aromas, uh, which exist in young wines, which are transformed into other things as they get, get older. Um, and, you know, um, so, and there's also this risk, you know, financial risk, you're, often paying a producer quite early for the wine and you're trusting him not to mess it up after you've tasted it, you know. Um, things like, you know, fining, if you fine, I mean, you can do more damage almost to fining than you can with filtration. I mean, people do less fining in filtration. So in the end, it, it's quite a tricky thing to do. And therefore, what you try and do is reduce your risk. You're trying to buy from the, the best people well, the, sorry, the people that you trust that are going to sort of, first of all, bottle the wine you've tasted because you know, that's the first thing with wine. Um, and also, you know, not, not, not make errors during the, the, the final process. Um, you know, the ideal way to, way to buy wine would be to sit down 12 months after the bottling, when all the wines have been bottled, all the fining, filtration, the bottling has been done, and you taste them side by side in the same room at the same temperature and make, make a comparison. You know, all of that is not possible when you're buying on Primeur. At the same time, the advantage for the customer is that we take our lowest margins on wines on Primeur because you buy the wines early, you pay up front, and that helps us finance the stock. So in return for you helping us finance the stock, we, we give the lowest possible price. And you know we try always when we sell, when there's, if any wine is left over and is sold on the catalog, we always try and make sure that that's at a higher price than what you paid for it. Um, you know, which hopefully will happen anyway if you buy from the good growers and so forth. But we don't guarantee that. We don't. Um, we don't give advice for investment, um, because what we want you to do is enjoy the wine and take pleasure in it, not 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 sell it on. And uh, in some cases, we're offering lower margins on some wines than our competitors. So, you know, you could buy it cheaper from us and then sell it. Um, but we're offering it to you cheaply because you're a member of the wine site and you, we want you to enjoy it. So that's some thoughts really about on Primeur. So I think, you know, just, just take the notes with a slight pinch of salt because they're not, uh, they're, they're, they're notes of a wine in progress. They're not a finished wine. And therefore, and as I said, there's a certain variability um, uh, on, on the timing of the tastings and then you know uh, one is not a machine there are days when you feel better and you taste better than others so um, as I said don't hang on every single adjective uh, if you're being swayed I mean I think as I said the shape and the form of the wine you, you can tell but the very fine detail um, is something that you, you can't always capture um, I'm guessing with your 27 years of experience, you're starting to have a little bit more confidence in being able to predict how wine will, will move forward on that journey? Well, yes and no. I mean, there are vintages which you think, ah, oh, well, you know, this is, 
this is soft and open. It's never going to close up. And then, you know, three years later, it closes up. And uh, it's still quite tricky, uh, really, to, to know how a wine is going to evolve. Um, the best record really is a track record of, of people you've been dealing with for a long time, you know. Um, I mean, not, you know, only a small amount of people offer wines on Primeur. So a lot of people ask, well, why isn't this on Primeur? Why isn't that on Primeur? For us, on Primeur is really quite a big offer. And so one of the criteria for what goes in the offer is simply how much wine we have. And if we have very, very, you know, if we have small amounts of cheaper wines, they, they tend to go in the list. Um, and not everyone offers on wine on Primo. You know, for example, Dujac and Rousseau, they don't offer their wines on Primo. Um, and some people have asked me, well, why don't you have much Chablis in the offer? Well, you know, we're offering a 20s now. I would think something like 70% of all Chablis is bottled and sold um in april last year you know it's only a small amount of chambly that sees long aging and in fact as i said at the start you know really on primeur is a way of helping us and the producer finance a wine that needs a long time to um uh, long time to mature during the elevage stage before bottling um and be something also that needs two or three years in bottle because you know wines that we're offering now <coughs> excuse me the 20s that we're offering now in uh in march 22 won't be delivered until spring 23 and a lot of wines are already ready for drinking then so it's you know it's not appropriate to put in wines that already able to be drunk. So on Primera is a specialised thing and it's a certain category of wines that go in there. So, so it's not appropriate to put everything in there. Um, and so, just, just on that, Toby, there was a question from Peter Cousins asking, if you don't buy on Primera but wait until wines have been bottled, do you miss out on the best wines? Uh, so I guess that kind of answers that question and it, it does depend. Yeah, I mean... <coughs> As I said, there's a time to choose wines. Um, I mean, with the best domains, as I say, if you've been buying, you get an allocation and you have to confirm that allocation when it's offered to you. Because if you don't want it, someone else is snapping at your heels to get it generally for a good grower. So really all the wines that um, are offered on allocation are confirmed in November. And a lot of those will go on, on Prima, but not, not everything. Um, and I mean, generally, obviously, the sooner, the sooner you're able to, you know, if you're good at tasting wines early, then you can go to a producer and you can reserve wines before other people. So um, the earlier you buy, obviously, the, the greater spread you get. But as I said, with most of the top domains, you have an allocation which has to be confirmed in, in November, December. So um, it's at that point where you have to taste and make the decision. Um, by the way, if, if there are any questions, very, very happy to take them as we're, we're going along. Uh, please just um, you know send them to Tim or whatever and uh, very happy to answer them. Yeah, so a lot are coming through. So we will try to get through as many as, as we can. I will just say to start, if you're asking about a particular wine or what wine will I buy, we probably won't be able to cover that. Um, Toby, you kind of summed it up nicely before. Could you just maybe explain your, your fears about saying this is the wine of the year to buy? Yeah. Um, I have written about 10,000 words in the offer. And in the offer... If you read between the lines, you can sort of see what I think of the best wines, but I don't really wish to explicitly say, oh, this is the wine to buy. Because, um, you know, if people follow what I say, it's just going to make that wine oversubscribed. And, you know, we don't get very much of each of these wines, you know, much less than you'd get in Bordeaux. 
Um, so it's partly the reason why there are so many of them, because, uh, you know, I can't get so much of what, you know, if I want a lot of Santo Bar, I have to buy from a lot of different producers. Um, and also, uh, what's very important is that I, I do wish people, if they can, to make their own mind up about wine, simply because everyone's palate is very different. Um, I mean, part, I'm part of a group of tasters. Uh, we call it Bergfest. And, and, you know, there's the great and the good Jasper Morris and Neil Martin, Neil Beckett, um, and uh, <coughs> quite a few Nascon buyers, you know, from JMB, Barrier Brothers, uh, Flint Wines, and so forth. And, and we're all professionals and we all taste together. But even, our, even between us, we have quite big differences in, in what we like and what we don't like. And I believe part of this is, is due to how much saliva you have on your tongue, you know, particularly, I think, your, the way you perceive tannins. And everyone's different, you know. It's like the old thing about Brussels sprouts, isn't it? That, that for years, you know, there was this big debate about so many people hating it and some people loving it. And then I think they've, they've actually discovered that, that one does have a gene genetic predisposition to like or dislike things. So, you know, taste is very, very personal. And, and my own feeling is, if you can, is to try and taste around a few producers and then follow the producer that you like. Um, because the producer will make a good wine even in a difficult year. And um, such is the um, variation in style and quality of a grower that the grower's style and quality can be much, much more important than an appellation. You know, that's why we say an appellation. Don't say, oh, I just want a Gevry Chambertin and then choose the, the cheapest Gevry Chambertin that's on offer. Um, because, you know, if you take someone like Morte, for example, whose his Gevry village is probably about 70 and you can get Gevry village for 30, comparing the two producers, um, is chalk and cheese because Morte, who's 70, that looks expensive for the appellation. But if you taste the quality, he's as good as some people Premier Cruz, you know, which is 70, 80, 90 pounds. And I, so I think, you know, there is the complication in Bordeaux, in Burgundy, <coughs> that, you know, people are making wines from the same vineyards. The vineyards are shared often between, you know, famously Rougeau, you know, Clos Rougeau, Grand Cru, you've got 60 or 70 people with vines there. Um, and um, people wouldn't, I think, make that decision with, say, Bordeaux, because you wouldn't say, oh, you know, you might be looking at a Poyac. You might say, oh, I'm not going to buy a Chateau Lafitte. God, that's three times the price of Grand Puy Lacoste. I'll buy Grand Puy Lacoste instead. Um, no, they're very different wines. I mean, I think what, what, what's great about Bordeaux is the wines are uniquely identified by their name. So, you know, in Bordeaux, you only have to say Chateau, Chateau Le Tour, Chateau Lafitte, Grand Prix Lacoste, whatever. And that identifies the wine. In Burgundy, you need really two bits of information. You need the grower and the vineyard. Um, so, you know, it's slightly more complicated. You've got to have two things rather than one. But an amazing number of people, <clears throat> you know, seem to think that, that the, you know, if, if, if you buy, you know, uh, uh, Claude Duvois, Marcinet, uh, you know, we have some from Jado and some from Patay, um, you know, that they might be interchangeable and, and they're really not. They're very different. <clears throat> so, you know, we used to, we used to list um, our Burgundy wines in increasing order of cost. And uh, what I've done is list them by uh, producer. So try if you can. I know it's, it seems difficult, but for me, it's no more different to say, well, you know, you know, if you're a Bordeaux lover, you know, Poyac, you've got two Grand Cru, you know, Premier Grand Cru classes, you've got Lafitte and Latour. You know, Lafitte's very elegant and Latour's very powerful. I mean, those are the house styles of the chateau. And, uh, and so it's the very same way, the house style of the grower, um, you know, is very, very different. Um, 
And some people use whole bunch, you know, which gives you this less extractions, lovely floral aromas. Some use de stem grapes, some use a mixture. Those do influence styles. And so um, Burgundy is a little bit more complicated, but uh, like all things, you know, I think there's an interest about um, a subject. And if you really get into it, you, you will start to research and uh, get proficient in the, in the differences. And that's part of the joy of Burgundy. That there is a complexity, um, but there's a lot of enjoyment too. You mentioned there, Toby, that uh, good producers can even can make good wine even in, in difficult years. Um, but there is a lot of importance placed on on vintage conditions. Um, so looking at twenty twenty, I know you've you've said you've written ten thousand words. There's a lot to be said already. Um, but can you just share your your general feelings on the, on the vintage and how it's shaping up at this stage? Yeah. Um... First of all, I think generally 2020 was a pretty easy year for the growers because it, there weren't very many problems with fungal diseases which tend to occur in more humid years. 2020 was a warm year, a very warm year, a dry year. Although, you know, everyone who's tasted it, all the professional buyers, you know, we've all said to one another, it doesn't taste like a wine from a warm year. And, you know, it's quite easy to lie with statistics. You know, there was a statistician who worked out that uh, the most dangerous, more people died in a hospital than anywhere else. So, you know, if he was ill, he wasn't going to go into hospital. <laughs> um, so in the same way, you know, statistically, 2020 is a very warm year. But what's introduced and what's interesting is the distribution of the heat. And most of the heat occurred in January and February. That's when it, I think uh, I wrote this down somewhere. Um, January and February were roughly 120% hotter than normal. But most of all the other months were about 10% warmer. So it is warmer, um, but the chief effect of the heat was to bring the vintage forward. So it was a very early flowering and, you know, pretty early harvest, you know, which was like the end of, end of August some were even like the 20th of August. So it was very early harvest, but it was a very early flowering. And um, historically, you know, you say that roughly 100 days between flowering and harvest. And this was a little bit less than that, but not massively less. So, um, you know, I think, for example, for white wines, I think it's a great wine vintage. Um, of, it's very, very good. It may even be great. Um, I mean, I think it's certainly the best since 17 or maybe even 14. Um, it's a little richer maybe than 14, but still you're in the classic Burgundian uh, spectrum, you know, of, uh, uh, of very mineral shabbly, aptly, floral, uh, Puglini, you know, sort of uh, slightly more, slightly richer Merceau, but you're not into the sort of... Um, the richness that you got in say to 2015 or 16 where the wines were very honeyed you know there was no botrytis it's a classic it's really a classic vintage and it's absolutely beautiful i don't think you can go wrong with 20 i mean it, it's lovely yeah. the reds are very slightly more different because um i know a lot of people are very preoccupied by alcohol and um the thing about uh red wines is that the sugar production in the grape which is transferred which is transformed by the yeast into alcohol so the potential alcohol <coughs> sorry is pretty much proportional to the weather because so photosynthesis is is uh, is dominated by light and heat but um the tannins are actually synthesized from the sugars and they're much, that's more of a process. And so the tannin ripeness uh, is, much, is much more a process of time. And so in hot years, and we've seen it with, um, with New World wines for a very long time, and it's been happening in Europe now, you know, particularly in 2009, 2010 in Bordeaux, 
uh, in the hot years in Burgundy is that at a certain moment, you, you may get sugars where you have maybe 13 degrees potential alcohol, which would be perhaps when you would like to harvest. But at that time, the tannins are not quite ripe. Um, and so the dilemma is, do you pick there at 13 degrees, which is, you know, an ideal alcohol level, but the tannins are a little bit firm? I mean, if they're just firm, then a little bit of time in barrel is, is going to soften those up. But if they're green, they're going to remain green. So the dilemma is, do you pick at that level or do you wait a little bit longer until you get tannin ripeness? And so... Because you don't have tannin in white wines, you don't have that dilemma, but with reds you do. So um, I've given roughly some dates as to when people picked. And although people's ripeness at the same date between domains is not the same because it all depends on yield and cultural practices, it's, it's impossible to have a direct correlation between domains. But if you look, you can get a rough idea of when they picked. And on the whole, the people who picked earlier made wines which have a little bit less alcohol and then there are a group of people like uh, say Grivo, Berguet, Jean-Marc Vincent um, who picked later and some got wines I mean most of the wines are around 14 at that level but one or two are 14 and a half so it's, it's not a year with massive alcohols uh, but it's wine with slightly higher alcohols so there are in those later pick wines, you actually get a sumptuous, creamy texture. I mean, Grivo, who pick late, I thought was one of the stars of the vintage. And they're sort of rich, flamboyant, flamboyant wines. You know, they're wonderful. Um, and some people get a bit worried about the alcohols. And of course, you know, none of us want to have, you know, we, we, want, we don't want to drink lots of alcohol. But, um, you know, a wine that shows alcohol is a wine that has alcohol and nothing else. Um, but if you have a, a big wine, which has a lot of tannin, a lot of colour, good acidity and high alcohol, if they're sort of proportional, then you really don't notice the alcohol. Um, and I would say that is really the case with 2020, that even though some of the wines are slightly higher in alcohol, you don't feel the alcohol because they're proportionate. Because... You know, I didn't really say, but it was a very warm year. And in warm years, you get high degrees of colour and tannin. And indeed, 2020 has got record amounts of colour and tannin. So the wines have great stuffing. They're ripe, but they're powerful. They've got lovely silky tannins. Um, and they've got really good acidity um, for considering their ripeness. I try and give the pHs, which is like a measure of the force of the acidity, but the acidity, and it's quite good sometimes to give a number because, um, you know, high, medium and low is uh, very sort of uh, uh, subjective. So I do occasionally give numbers just so that you can um, have a more of a, uh, a, a feel for the, for the actual size of the, the amount of acidity. But the acidity is really good, you know. So the wines, as I said at the beginning, the wines don't taste like they're from a warm vintage. I mean, it's a lovely vintage, you know. Um, there are just these sort of two categories really with the reds and the whites are more homogeneous, you know. And I think it's pretty good all over the place, you know. Um, I think it is probably pretty good for some of the Bourgoins and the village wines. Um, you know, 30 years ago when it start, you know, the, the vintage was in October. Uh, so many vintages were spoiled by autumn rains. Um, but, um, uh, but, you know, now that's really not the case, you know. Um, and the Bourgoins tend to be planted on the bottom of the slope in heavier clay soils, which are cooler soils. And they tend to be, they tend to have less ripening ability, but have higher yields. So they're almost caught in a vicious circle where they have, they have to have high yields to be, uh, to be uh, worth selling, to be cheaper, and they have less ripening ability. Um, but obviously in a warm year, the clay soil retains more water and it heats up. Um, so I think um, 
there are some good villages and Bourgoins uh, in 20. I mean, I always try and tell people to trade up because in the end you get, I do feel that I do try and weed out the wines that are, are not good. Um, so I do think that if you can trade up, it's better. But I think 2020 would be one year where you get, you know, quite good wines lower, lower down the, the quality hierarchy. Uh, as I said, I think it's pretty good everywhere. You know, the Chablis are good, the Macanay are good, the Cote d'Or are good. Um, um, maybe the Cote de Nuit for Reds is slightly favoured because some of you may know, but Cote de Nuit is mainly east facing and Cote de Bone is southeast facing. So the Reds in the south. Um, uh, are harvested a, a few days earlier, up to a week earlier than the ones in the Cote de Nuit. And again, because it was a hot year, um, the, uh, the grapes got riper very quickly, particularly on some of the sandy soils in the Cote de Bone. Whereas the Cote de Nuit uh, had a little bit more time. There was a tiny bit of rain at the end. So um, I think the Cote de Nuit is maybe slightly better for for reds, although um, I think I mentioned that um, uh, communes which are famous for having quite firm tannins, you know, things like um, in the Cote de Nuit, uh, Nuit Saint-Georges, and in the Cote de Bone areas like um, Alos Coton and Pomar, uh, they were really good. I mean, I think Pomars are tremendous. I've been trying to buy a few more. There are a few more in this. I, I visited a, a domain in Pomar, hoping I could add a new one, but uh, they didn't quite come up with stuff. Um, but, you know, the Pomars are no longer a rough bruiser with agricultural tannins. The tannins are sweetened and you've got sweet, sweetened up. And you've got that body. So I think really Pomar is really coming into its own. And 30 or 40 years ago, you know, when people wanted big, powerful wines, Pomar commanded a, um, a really big premium over many wines and uh today historically uh it hasn't but i think uh it's getting back back up there in terms of quality and maybe the price hasn't quite caught up with the, the quality i think members always love hearing those those kind of potential uh yeah uh discrepancies uh but you mentioned there toby that um the numbers and that you're now providing pH levels and picking dates and, and you're giving that uh, a bit more specific information. And there's been a couple of questions from members about, uh, to paraphrase, like, I guess, the science of wine. And, and one member asked, uh, a taster might not be able to predict how a wine evolves, but could a chemist? Um, I guess that is a question, but also how worried are you of over-analysis and over-reliance on, on numbers now that we do kind of, have more access to to those figures i think really the i mean i think there was a time when people did go too far by numbers and there's actually people have actually vineyards have gone much much more back to actually tasting grapes you know um, um and then perhaps confirming their their wish to pick with some numbers so i think I think the numbers offer a sort of reassurance. Um, um, but no, I think, you know, I think, uh, you know, wine is a blend of art and science. And I think, uh, uh, you know, most, most, most growers now have been to wine school and uh, um, really ha have a strong, um, uh, a strong uh, upbringing in uh, knowledge of chemistry. And that is important. Um, but in the end, you know, it's good not just to go by numbers. You know, I think uh, um, when you analyze the wine, I mean, you can analyze what you, at the moment, um, I think they've been trying to get, you know, <laughs> sniffing robots, which uh, are supposed to be able to sort of sniff out all sorts of things. But, you know, you can take two wines with exactly the same analysis. I mean, all it, it tells you normally alcohol, it tells you um, the pH, which is the force of acidity, the total acidity, you know, which is the amount of the acidity. Um, and often you measure volatile acidity, which is, you know, you know, you can get spoiled yeast, which produce a vinegary-like smell, and that's what, what volatile acidity is. 
Um, and, you know, a little bit of volatile acidity gives some complexity, but too much uh, actually uh, destroys the wine on the palate. Um, but none of these things really tell you about the smell, the texture, the flavor, um, the quality of the wine, the harmony of the elements. All those really are very subjective judgments, which, which we make as humans, which, uh, which so far, you know, have not been... Um, and are not able to be quantified by machines yet. So, um, in, in fact, the, the numbers just give a very basic analysis of the wine. Uh, you were mentioning just about the, the overall quality of the whites and uh, it may be a great vintage. Um, and you also mentioned Jasper Morris earlier. And a quote I read from him was that even if it's not a great vintage, there'll be a lot of great wines this year. Um, which I thought was a nice, nice way of putting. Yeah, and I didn't really say about the reds. I mean, I think the reds are very, very good too. I think the very best reds, some of them are great. There's this slight difference in styles, so it makes it slightly more difficult to generalise. But um, I think there are some wonderful wines, and, and probably 20 is the best of the, the 18, 19, 20 trilogy. Um, uh, partly because I think people now are, are, are getting more and more used to dealing with, with this style of vintage. Um, and, uh, you know, you've got to arrange your pickers early and uh, the sacred August holiday time where all the French go on holiday for the whole of August. Well, you know, the really good growers, you know, uh, didn't take their holidays in August because they were preparing. And then just before the, just before the harvest, you know, some people are bottling. They're um, they're making space uh, in the tanks. They're cleaning. They're cleaning the winery. They're uh, getting the growers, the, the pickers, organised. Uh, it's quite an organisation. So uh, um, people are now much more used to being flexible because you know, 2021. You know, it was a month later. You know, it was uh, mid, mid mid September. Um, but, um, you know, they're much more used to that now. And the best people have that flexibility to be able to rearrange things. Uh, because particularly, you know, when the harvest is early, well, when the harvest is in August, you know, it's quite warm. And so the maturities are changing quite quickly. Um, you know, historically, um, the vintage was in the cool of the autumn because before one had... Uh, electricity to artificially cool things. Um, you know, if you were harvesting very hot grapes, you didn't have the capacity to cool them. So, um, you know, you were harvesting them in, in, in October, you know, in the 50s in Burgundy, when it was much, much cooler. And, and you know, when it's much, much cooler, the maturities change much more slowly. So you have... Um, it's much less critical exactly when you pick because the maturities are changing more slowly. But in August, um, you know, sometimes you can get, I don't know what the figures are, but you can get half a degree or a degree sometimes in a, in a week. So, you know, and sometimes the harvest takes a week. Um, so, you know, what you, what you harvest at the beginning is going to be different from what you harvest at the end. And so, you know, uh, it's difficult to get pickers these days. Um, but the best people manage to get pickers and they often manage to get really big teams of pickers so they can complete the harvest very quickly um, because of this phenomenon of, of, of when you pick early, the maturity has changed very quickly. I was reading that some of the, um, some of the growers that were stubborn and did stick to their holidays, they, they came back with, uh, with tears in their eyes when they did come back and saw, saw what, what happened, which I guess does show just how quickly it can change. Um, a couple of questions of similar ilk, as so I'll uh, just use one, um, and it's a common one, which I know you don't always love to, to try to answer, but um, what vintage would you compare 2020 to for red wines? I think it is very difficult to, to compare. Um, because I think what you have is, as I said before, you have a wine which has, it's from a warm vintage, but it doesn't taste like it's from a warm vintage. Um, so you have ripe fruits, you have mainly black fruit, 
um, and you have a lot of concentration of uh, tannin um, and color uh, and a reasonably good acidity. I mean, I, I would say, you know, it's, 215 was, was a fantastic vintage with, rec at the time, record levels of color and tannin. So in terms of reds, I think it's, it's a bit like 15, but it's slightly rounder and richer than 15. Um, for the whites, um, that's really difficult because, um, as I said, you know, the aromas are fairly classic. Um, um, the alcohol's are sort of normal, the 13. Um, but they're not austere wines. I mean, because I think it was warm, I think um, the wines are not closed, um, but they're very high quality. So, you know, often the best vintages, you know, it's like something like a 14, which was cooler. They need much more time to open up and they're relatively closed. These seem to have, you know, the feeling of, uh, of uh, being much more approachable early but i think we'll have the have the stuffing to uh last a long time so i think i think it's really difficult to find a vintage that's like 20. Uh, i mean i think 20 is finer than 18 or 19. um and as i said I, it's, I think it will so early now but i think it'll stand in comparison with this, say 14 you know which was the best vintage for about 20 years but it's a slightly less austere but still quite classically framed vintage you know 2020 so i don't know if that helps it, it, it is it is tricky i mean normally one can find you know you find a certain degree of <clears throat> a degree of comparison with another vintage but you know with a slight twist otherwise they would it will be the same, but um, you know, grapes grapes really reflect the, the the place and the the climate where they're grown. And in each year, you know, it's different, and that's part of the fun. Um, all I can say really is that you know, in whites, it's really lovely, and you can't really go wrong. So, uh, and I think it is it is a really good vintage. As I said, for some wines, possibly great. So. Um, if you if you need some wine, I wouldn't hesitate to buy because I really think it's lovely. And then I guess particularly with Dom Primera, a lot of people are buying with a mind to longer term storage. Uh, I know for myself, it's a, a birth vintage for, for my first son. So I'm considering putting some stuff for the longer term. Uh, and we've had a few questions about drinking dates and drinking windows that you've provided. Um, how, how easy is it to predict what a wine uh, to, to, to do your drinking windows for an offer like this? It's very, very difficult. I mean, with whites, I, I am quite uh, influenced by the closure because as you know, um, there has been a problem with corks um, and possibly because of global warming, I think corks are not as dense as they used to be. So um, there's a very good synthetic, there's a cork made, made from cork called a DM, um, and that really has managed to control. First of all, it gets rid of um, corkiness, trichloroanisole, TCA, and it also, the way it's made, it, it actually uh, confers a regular porosity. And, you know, at the moment, natural corks are graded on their appearance. Um, they're trying to put a system where they um, can try and assess its density, but at the moment, they're not doing that. Uh, they're trying. Um, so you might have the most beautiful cork, but it might have a, you know, an insect burrowing in the middle of it, uh, be quite, po quite porous. So um, I'm giving much longer drinking dates to wines that are, that are close with DM, particularly the whites, because they're more fragile than I am to the others. So. It, it is very, very difficult. I mean, I've actually given, where the whites are closed with DM, I've probably given longer drink dates than some other people, uh, which is not because you can't drink these wines earlier, the 20s, but because I think that they will develop a lot of complexity if you keep them longer. 
Um, likewise, the reds. I mean, the reds are really have wonderful amounts of color and tannin, but the tannin soft. So the wines, again, I think uh, could be approachable early, but I, I really think they're going to be able to last a very long time um, because they have these very high levels of tannin and color. And those are the elements which uh, allow a wine to develop. And um, you know, the great thing about about the top wines is is that they develop a complexity with time in bottle um, that a lesser wine can't. So um, even though um, these are quite approachable because I think the tannins are soft, I think that if you leave them a little bit longer, you're going to get that lovely bottle development. As I said, you know, you get all these um, processes uh, where the tannins and the and the colour comes come together and form along the chains uh, and, and give a, a lovely softer mouthfeel and you've got these sterification and hydrolysis, all these sorts of uh, um, changes which develop beautiful aromas uh, and overlay, um, you know, lovely bottle-aged aromas on top of the, 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 the primary fruit aromas. So I think, uh, so I think it's, it's going to, it's, if you want to keep it a long time, you can. Good news for my son, maybe not so good news for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, the problem is on the whole, if, if you want something that's going to last 20 or 30 years, it tends to be the more expensive wines. And uh, even then you don't know if your son is actually good. You know, when, when, when you're 20 and the wine's about ready to drink, do you want to drink a sort of 50 quid bottle or do you want to sell it all and buy a, buy a motorbike? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's a tricky one. Um, yeah. I think port, obviously, is uh, is very long lived considering the money, um, the dearers. Um, but anyway, no, it's a lovely idea. Uh, I was born in '61, and did my father lay down a case of '61 at all? No, he didn't. <laughs> um, so, a question uh, from a member: What impact does Toby think COVID had on 2020? I've read that growers and producers were able to devote more time and attention to their vines because they were unable to travel, didn't have to attend wine fairs, etc. Do you think that did have an impact? Or less yeah, so in Burgundy where they already do do that? Yeah, I, I'm, Marcel, Marcel, I think, noted that in his own offer. Um, it occurred to me less because I think, what, you know, what you've just said, I mean, I think the really good growers... Um, you know, really between April and uh, July, they're in the vineyard all the time and you've got to react. Um, so, um, you know, most of the top people, you know, or, or perhaps not the top people, most small domains, you know, it, it is the owners plus a few hired hands who do all the work and they don't travel really the best ones. So, you know, I, I think um, on the whole, I don't think that made such a difference. Although obviously, um, you know, because because um, the vineyard work can be done spaced out. I mean, the, the vineyard work wasn't affected by COVID in the same way, uh, unless people did get COVID, unfortunately. But, you know, people could work. Their work wasn't compromised in the vineyards by COVID because, you know, you're outside. So uh, I hadn't really thought about it, and, and, I, and I think you know, for the for the really top domains and, and the best organised ones, that won't be a difference because they're they're not travelling or going anywhere, you know, during the critical times in the vineyard anyway. And you have to be very very adaptable because you can't really go away for a very long time because you know, uh, I mean, in twenty twenty there weren't fungal diseases, but in twenty twenty one. You know, it was very different. There was a massive pressure of rhodium. And if you don't spray, you've got to spray preventatively. Um, so when the conditions are such that the this fungus is going to form, you've got to get you've got to go out and you've got a you've got a day to spray your, your domain in. And, and, and if you miss it, uh, you're going to get rhodium. And um, I think on my Instagram account, I, I, I photographed a couple of vineyards side by side where one 
one was brown and had hardly any leaves and the other one was green you know and uh, if you don't treat if you don't you know spray your vines uh, and you don't have leaves leaves are what you know photosynthesize and ripen the grape then and then if it's really bad you get a him on the berry and it splits the berry and uh, you've lost your crop um and so you know 2021 you could walk around and look at vineyards and and the good guys their leaves are still green and other people's weren't it was quite flagrant um and that's really you know dedication and timing um and for 20 because it was a much drier year there was, there was very little pressure of diseases so um in fact it, it wasn't so crit critical but in 2021 it really was and it also was combined with a cooler year, 2021. Um, so, you know, the grapes, if you had higher yields, which the lazy growers have, and if you didn't spray your vines and you got less functioning leaves, then you may not have, you know, been able to ripen your grapes. And when you have green grapes, um, you get green wines, you, the first thing you have to do is get right grapes but I mean uh, so for me it was it was a factor in 21 but um, um, sorry I mean the um, yeah I mean for me I think uh, 2020 was relatively easy so I think for me uh, the COVID aspect didn't really apply. Uh, some members and you've been talking about 2021 already looking ahead and uh, recognizing the difficulties that were faced that year and uh, one member, Nick Stark, has asked, do you anticipate a lack of wine to go around next year or a price spike? So should we stock up this year? It's always very tricky to say, but as I said at the outset, what, you know, Bordeaux prices its wines roughly in April. Um, so it doesn't have the next vintage and, and it has a different way of looking at it. Chateau asked their negotiants to go out into the market and ask, given the quality of the vintage and uh, the quantity and the economic climate, you know, what, what price will the market bear? So Bordeaux wines will rise and fall according to the quality of the vintage and uh, the supply and demand. In Burgundy, um, as I said at the beginning, they don't price, you know, they weren't pricing their 20s until... November 21 last year, by which time in time they've got the 21 harvest in. And most people, you've seen some price rises with 20, um, mainly, mainly, well, because it's good, because um, uh, a lot of people went out uh, and tasted the 20s and didn't the 19s because of the COVID. Um, but also, um, 21 is a very small crop, and um, most of the producers have priced in what is about a half a crop generally, but places in Merso, it's like 30% of a normal crop. Most people have priced in um, the lack of volume of 21 so they can recover their costs. So um, normally the Burgundian system, as I said, is um, you have the, the next vintage in your cellar before you price the previous one. And you tend to go up in a year which is good or short. And in a sense, <laughs> in 20, they had a very good vintage and in 21, they had a short vintage. So in many cases, as I said, they've priced in the short 21 harvest by increasing the price of the 20s, because obviously in 20, you've got twice as much volume as you have in 21. Um, and also, the, and so pricing in the, the 21, the idea is not to go up in 21, um, because 21, I think, will be slightly less good, although the good people will have made good wines, but there'll be half a crop. Um, but to go up in a less good vintage is uh, less acceptable. So people have gone up in 20, which is a very, very good vintage. So, um, you know, I think with 21, the good people will have made good wines. As I say, I was talking about the Iridium. I mean, the good growers um, have lower yields and they will have had, without a photosynthesizing leaves, 
And so, you know, it'll be a completely different style of vintage, much more typical one. You know, the harvest was mid-September, it was much cooler. So, you know, you've got higher acids, uh, fresher flavours, more red fruit. Um, and I say all this having not tasted the wines, because for me, you know, if you taste the wine before malolactic, it's very, very difficult to predict what it's going to be like. Because the mallow has such a completely uh, transformative uh effect on the on the structure and the flavors of the wines um so um so yes i mean generally what will happen is is that 21 is likely to be the same price as 20 uh for those who've priced in that and so uh you know it'll be it'll be um, the same price as 20 but probably slightly less good and it'll be half a crop so uh but you know I can't guarantee all that. that. That's what people tell you. Um, it may also then be modified because when they price the 21s, they'll have had the, t- the 22 crop. <laughs> you know, if a 22 crop is really low, then they might have to increase. If it's really big, maybe. May, 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 may I mean, historically, in Burgundy, really no one goes down in price. And that's the difference between Bordeaux and Burgundy. And as I said, you know, Bordeaux is very much... The price goes up and down with the quality and the supply and demand and the economic climate when the wines are released. Burgundy, as I said, you tend to have these jumps um, when you have a very good vintage or a you know, very good vintage and very high demand has been the case um, and or a short crop. Um, and then on the whole, they, they, they say pretty stable, maybe with the old little cost of cost of uh, materials increase of a couple of percent or something. So it goes up in stages. So um, although 20 is more expensive than 19, it's, you know, the price is unlikely to go down. So uh, I think, you know, in the years to come, you know, if, if the following vintages are not as good and they're the same price, then 20 will be effectively uh, looked on as good value for money. So, so I would, I mean, I would buy 20 simply because, you know, it's a really good vintage. Uh, and it's likely, you know, it's likely that 21 is going to be the same price and that's good. So, um, so yeah, I, I would, I mean, I would definitely recommend 20 because uh, I, I really think it's genuinely very good. And, and that's really the best basis to buy a wine. And whether you'll make money on it, you know, we don't, we don't really give advice on that. But um, yeah, those are really my thoughts. Thank you. Uh, within the offer, there are a number of uh, wines that are offered either in cases of six or in some cases, cases of three, or even in some cases of one. Is that just to spread the, the allocation as widely as possible? Or Yes, it is. I mean, uh, as some of you may know, I mean, um, many companies... Uh, favor their big hitters and so some of the really wonderful domains you know like uh, like Rumier, like Katia, uh, Domaine Le Fleve. I mean we we put those wines in the offer I mean they they go on the web rather than the printed offer I don't know quite know why but that's what our marketing department have decided um, <clears throat> but we have an allocation system and so the wines are allocated uh, on a certain basis, um, and such is the demand. I mean, curiously, you know, the top wines are so demanded, partly because you know we are one of the few companies that does offer them. As I said, most other companies, those really sexy domains, are never offered, and they go straight into um, the sellers of their best clients, uh, often with a. Um, a certain demand that if you're getting those, you you ought to buy, uh, you know, some lesser wines as well, less demanded wines as well. Um, but we don't do that. We whatever we have, we put up on show. Um, and um, you know, it's very tricky to be. We're a relatively large company, and it's difficult to offer Burgundy. This Burgundy is really made in very small quantities, you know, compared to Bordeaux. I think, as everyone knows. Um, so, you know, we get tiny quantities, so, you know, we try and spread them out as fairly as, fair, fairly as we can. And as you said, you know, we're now down to single bottles of some of the, some of the most expensive wines. Um, and that's part of the, uh, the, um, 
cooperative mentality of the wine society to share it out equally or to make the top wines go as far as we can you know but even so there's an allocation process and uh, not everyone's going to get them but uh, they're rationed according to our allocation system which is which tries to be fair um, so, Toby, time is absolutely flying. I can't believe we filled up that hour so so quickly and still have so many unanswered questions. Um, what I would say to all members is Toby has been uh, very generous with his time and he's been very active on the community, which is our online web forum. Uh, and that is where uh, he is answering a lot of uh, more particular questions about individual wines or stylistic differences between one wine A and wine B. So... If you do have uh, inclination, that is a chance for you to uh, follow up and maybe go into more detail. But hopefully what you found tonight was a, a good insight into the vintage and into what uh, Toby's thoughts and um, feelings are, are on it. So, uh, yeah, Toby, any any final comments? No, not really. I, you know, I really to think 2020 is a lovely vintage. So, you know, if you need... If you need to buy some wine, I, I wouldn't hesitate. And uh, you know, uh, it's it's quite a rich style. But I mean, someone asked me, you know, is it New Worldy? I don't think it's New Worldy at all. You know, I I did some tasting a while ago uh, when I was doing a tasting in Glasgow, Tim, and uh, uh, we, we we did some we did Pinot Noir, we did Burgundy and New World, and I tasted quite a lot of sort of forty to. 60 pound new world wines and i do think whilst the chardonnays are getting closer although there's still a gap you know i think your red burgundy is still quite different to new world pinot because it has it's it's drier it's more savory it has higher tannin and it has higher acidity and whereas the new world wines are sort of more particularly um led by the fruit and the fruit quality which is quite sweet um burgundy is is much more structured it's much more drier and even in a warm year as i said like 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 uh, 2020 you have really high levels of tannin and color and you have very good acidity for the level of ripeness so although they're they're sort of they're, they're big and rich and flamboyant um you know particularly the later picked ones um some of the early pick ones are really quite classic, but you know, generally it's a vintage with with a little bit more substance and uh, richness than some. Um, and you know, that's part of the joy of wine. I think uh, um, a vintage like thirteen or sixteen was fresher, and this is richer. And I think if you love wine, it's it's nice to have that variety. But uh, um, you know, if you're if you're worried that it's a new world vintage, new world style, it's not. For me, it's riper, but it's still Burgundian, and um, it's quite an accessible Burgundian vintage because you know um, there is this lovely ripeness of fruit um, and generosity of flavour. So, um, and as I said, it's quite good at the lower levels too. You know, which which the cooler you know, twenty twenty one is going to be much trickier for the Bourgoins. And the villages, because you know, as I said, their capacity of ripening is is lower because they have uh, uh, they have heavier soils and they have less less slopes, um, and so those wines uh, just just about get ripe in the cooler years, whereas in the riper years, like twenty, you know, they do ripen well. So uh, um, no, it's a lovely vintage. I, you know, if, as I said, if you need to buy, if you need to buy burgundy, then don't hesitate. With 20, 2020. Wonderful. Um, well, yeah, as I said, Toby, thank you, thank you so much. And uh, along with your notes, and I just remember saying that along with your notes, I think this has been a fascinating insight, and hopefully gives members a little bit more confidence in uh, enable being able to choose wines that will will uh, suit their own palate. So. Thank you for all your work in putting together the offer. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. And uh, yeah, thank you to all of the members who have, have come and asked, asked questions and uh, added to the event through the chat. So uh, yeah, a lovely evening. Tim, thanks very much for organising all. And uh, yeah, as Tim says, if you have any specific questions, I'll try and answer them as much as, as well as I can. And uh, the community forum is, is quite a, it's quite a good way of... Uh, communicating that and uh, you can read other people's posts who, who often 
you know, put up quite interesting questions, which I'm, I'm trying to answer as well as I can. And, you know, if you want to email me personally or speak to me, uh, you know, that's the draw of the wine society. We're not so big that, uh, you know, you can't ring me up or, or, or email me and I'm, you know, be happy to phone you back or uh, email you also, as well as the social media channels. Be careful what you wish for there, Toby. <laughs> All right, everyone, thank you very much for, for joining us this evening. And uh, yeah, we do hope to see you on further online events in the, in the near future.